Hello, good day. Welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we're still talking about program structures. And so let's just get going. And so this diagram, I sort of showed it very early, I think in like the first um, part one, when I was trying to illustrate or explain why we need to sort of think about breaking up our application. I said, well, imagine you had a project and within that project, you had multiple applications. Those applications had features that maybe they share and those features are pulling code from, you know, sort of subsystems or modules. So um, let's now step back a little bit. And if you remember the last video in part three, I talked about hidden pack packages. And before I continue down that path, I figured out oh, we should all make sure that oh, we're on the same page when we talk about module packages, files, and more, that we're all start, sort of talking about the same thing. And that's going to help us to make sure that there are no misunderstandings. Okay. And so let's just step back for a second and say, like, what is an application? And so there's a couple of ways you can come at this. You could start from the bottom and come up, you know, start with a little bit and build up. So you can start with like code and sort of build up and see how, where you get to or you can start from the top down. And so the approach I'm taking is to start from the top down. If you want to describe the human body to someone, you don't start with the atoms. Instead, what you do is you say, here's the human body. And then there are these parts, the head and the arms and the torso and so on. And then you now look at each part and you start breaking it down until you get to large organs and then smaller things, okay? And then eventually you get to cells and so on, okay? So let's start that way. So we have an application. And our application is composed of, you know, let's say packages, package A, B, C, whatever, right? More specifically, when we say a package, we're talking, for example, yeah, like main package. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to be using packages um, to that either you write or you get from somewhere else, third party. But your application is going to be composed of other packages. And so then we ask, like, what is a package? So we had, we had an application. We see it always composed of packages. And... Now we're looking at what is a package and a package is just a collection of files and it can be one or more files. As a matter of fact, um, there are no limits to how many files can be in a package. It's just a collection of the file and there's no convention how you name them. You can literally call all the files in a package file one, file two, file three, and so on. I wouldn't recommend it. It's probably a good idea to have some sort of name that when people look at it, they have some idea what's in that file. So if you're talking about a package that has to do with storage or your model for your application, you know, things that um, contain information that you might be able to persist, like if you're working with cars or people or person or whatever, that maybe you have a file that's, you know, car or person or whatever, that's, you know, sort of reflect what um, kind of information or what's defined or being said or done in that file. But other than that, that's just general programming, good programming practice, but there's no requirement that you give it any kind of name. Um, now, when we talk about a file, so we're going deeper now, right? When we talk about a file, what's inside of a file? Well, for Go, the only thing that you really need to do is say that oh, this file, in order to say that oh, it belongs to a certain package, is you have to put the package name. That's the only thing that's required. Everything else that you would put in a file, in a Go file, I'm talking about a Go file now. It's just like import statement. I noted it. I have the dotted lines around the outside to say that oh, this is optional. Package name is absolutely required. It is the first thing that besides comments, that's why I didn't put comments because, you know, that's optional, but I should have put it on this slide, but I didn't. But um, package name is the thing that says this file belongs to this package. Now, given that though, files for the same package must be in the same directory, then it seems redundant to have a package name, but that's all it is, okay? So you can't, oh, we haven't, I, I'm gonna show this later. So in Go, all the files for a package must be in the same directory, so they cannot span directories. So it's almost seem a little redundant that you still have to put the package name, but I think that makes it sort of obvious that, oh, oh I intend for this file to be in this package. Just know that oh, in terms of a Go file, Thing that's required is package name, import statements optional, constant optional, variable optional, type declaration optional, function optional. Okay, this is what I like about Go. These are all the things that you can put in a Go file, nothing else. Well, except comments, I leave out comments, but that's the only thing, right? 
Um, it's very little bit of information to keep in your head. Each one of these have a keyword that introduces these things. When you go to put a package, it's direct package. You go for import, it's direct import, cons, cons, var, blah, 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 right? And so, as I said, each one of these have their um, keyword that you use to introduce them, you know, and these are the keywords. And the only exception where there's a package that um, needs anything more than just a package name is when we talk about the main package and it needs a function. It needs the main function. That is only because if you're going to do a main package, when that's compiled into an application, that's an indication to create an application and therefore it needs somewhere to start. And so you need a main function, an entry point to think of it. So that's all. But other than that, and we'll see, we'll demonstrate this. So I'm at my command line. I'm going to copy um, the previous example three recursively means copy everything part three and then I'm going to copy it part four. And so if we go to, you know, part four here and we look and see what's inside, there's all this stuff. And today I don't want to use any of this. So I'm going to remove all this. So I'm going to do remove RF star and it's going to prompt me here because of what I'm using. Clean up my screen. And so I'll do VS code and I'll bring up VS code in this directory. So here's our VS code and it's sufficiently big, I think. Oh, what is this? Oh, get three to change the icon for that guy. And uh, maybe I reduce it just a little bit. Hopefully people can still see that. And so the thing I want to create is let's start off by creating a simple package file and just demonstrate that though you can just have the package name. And so I'll click new file and the format we went with is we said we have some package called pkga and we had a file called file one that go and I'm going to give it package and then it suggested a name for me and there we're going to use that package name and that's it. That's all I'm going to use. And if I come back to the command line and I do ls and I go to that package directory and again, I'll clean up ls. Uh, let me open up this a little bit more. And so I have this file and I could do, you know, and we can see that that's all I have in this file is the package keyword package. Key. And so what I can do is I can say, go build this package, right? And I can give you know all the Go files here to build and it builds successfully. Now, nothing changed. Now, I didn't get any executable in my folder or anything like that. Go doesn't do that. But what code does when you build a package is it actually compiles some code and put it in a certain location and it uses a cache. So how do you see what change or whatever? So let me open this up again a little bit more. And let's look at the time. It's 9.16 when I run this. So if I do go env and look at my environmental variables, come on you'll see that if I scroll back up, there's a um, go cache, go mod cache directory. So that's where that is. Then there's a go cache directory. So let's do that. I copy that too. And then I am going to do, um, let's do FD. So I'm going to say find everything in that directory. FD is this command that I use, but you know what? I can actually use LS and I go minus Re list recursively and then I can do put this path and then it lists that and so we can see that there were some files created um, you know somewhere yesterday whatever um, but we're looking for files that was created today on the 25th and we can see this right and I can do you know grab and I can do look for things that was created October 25th. Okay. And there you see that I have some directories. It doesn't matter what those directories name or are. And then there's this file called trim.txt. But you can see that oh, um, there were some files that were created at 915. Remember, this was when I looked at the time it was 916. So it was a little bit so we were wrong 915. So there's some information that was created there. I don't know what they are. Now, what we can do is we can see what kind of file these are if we're really interesting, interested in seeing that. So we can do that and I can do control C. Let's do this again. 
like this. And then if I go back here, oh, it's actually in the E3 directory. So I hope by now you're convinced that actually something happened. Um, and so, um, oh man, come on. Okay, so let's do this again. So I do file and I'm going to um, paste this directory. Um, let me say E3 and then there's a file and then I run it and it, okay, it actually says it's empty. So there's actually nothing in that file. Now I'm not checking all the files that were created, um, but um, that file, oh, it actually says zero bytes there. So I shouldn't waste my time checking it. Oh, there's another file um, in the CE directory and that guy is um, not, you know, um, so if I do file, paste that, CE directory, and there we go. And so this says it's ASCII text file. Um, I'm not sure what's in that file. So let's do that and let's do that. And so, yep, there's some information in there pointing to yet some other place or something. So anyway, it's telling me version one. So this is all information that I don't need to really worry about. There's a video in YouTube telling you about how to understand all this stuff. But what I really want to show you is that even though our file was empty, Go was still able to get us some information to build a cache so that if we ever want to build this into an application, it can keep track of, well, this is the file. That's why Go compile is so fast. If the file didn't change, the, you know, the hash or whatever matches up to this, then I don't need to recompile that file. So it actually builds some information. Okay, I know that doesn't seem very exciting, but I'm building up to something. And so let's go ahead and create a, another file. And so I want to make sure that oh, this is in the root directory here. And so we'll do pkgb, and then we'll call file1.go, and then again, package b, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll create another file, for example, and we'll call file2.go, and package b. And notice both files are completely empty, but they belong to the same package. And so, and you notice what I said before about, you know, the package name, um, the file being the same directory, right? It's gonna be an error if it's not. And so I can go to package B, and I can do go build, same thing. And again, this build, I'm not gonna torture you by going through trying to find a file and stuff. But again, they're all empty files, but they did result in some different caches and stuff. And you can actually find out which file and all that stuff by going through that cache and looking at all the hashes that were generated and you can actually find this information. So Go is keeping track of all this good stuff. Okay, so I've proven to you that in Go, all you need a Go file really need is a package. If you have a Go file that doesn't have a package, that's not valid. So if, for example, I do and I say pkg c that file one that go notice oh this is an error it's asking me to give it the package name right um we can try to go to this directory we already see it in the editor that it's already a problem but if we go try to build it you can see no package phone right expected package so it just needs a package okay so that's it for packages the other thing i said is that if you have a package main, that one is special. So let's do that. So we do this and let's say we have command and we have main.go. And so we're using the package main. So we could have used CMD, but here we're gonna specifically set out the files in here are main. And when you're using package main, they could be in a directory that has any name. It doesn't really matter. And so, um, so package main, and this one is a little bit special. And so if we go back and we do CMD, and we do go build, and you can see that the main function is undeclared in the main package. This is the only time that the package is, when you try to compile, it's gonna complain about not having something else. And so we have to have um, our main function. And that's all that's required. It could be empty, it doesn't need to do anything whatsoever. And so if I clean up here and I go build again, notice how oh, this builds successfully. And so this time I have an executable. Notice all the other time when I built a package, I had no function in it. It did not give me any kind of binary. It just created those cache files and all that stuff. And that is the reason why I want to show you that directory with the caches. 
to show you the difference between when you build a package that doesn't have main versus one that have main. When you build any package that has main, you, you must have a main function and it gives you a result in binary, right? And so if I do file on this program main, you can see it's an executable. Now, of course, if I wanted to build it for some other operating system, I can do something like this and say go OS is equal to, so let's say Windows, for example, and this will build a Windows binary for me, right? You can see that right there, main.exe. Right, come on, edit exe. And you can see this is executable for Windows. So of course, if I want to do the same thing for Linux, I could just put Linux and it's going to build me a Linux binary. And I can say go out minus O, for example, minus out, you know, A that out. And uh, let me see minus out. Why is it not take it? Minus O, A that out. And so, yeah. It's going to build it. And I still do ls here. Let's clean up ls. And you can see file a that out main and star. And you can see that it also is an ELF binary, which is for statically linked for Linux. And the other one is for Windows. And then, of course, for the Mac. Okay. So now we see the difference between, you know, a package and all packages are used and what's in them. Let's return to our presentation. Now let's talk about modules. Now, the, I, did, I didn't go any deeper after we get to files because even though we talk about the things that goes into files, after then, function, variables, imports, all those, those are just um, ASCII correct or rather Unicode characters, right? That's actually source code at that point. So we stopped sort of like at the cell level and we're not going into what's inside a cell. All right, but let's talk about modules. So modules are really interesting. Modules are a way of putting multiple packages together. It's all your group packages. So you can have, let's say, your company could have a module that contains within it e-commerce slash chart as a package, API slash REST as another package, API that gRPC as another package, storage slash Redis as another package, encapsulating and codifying how your company uses Res, gRPC, Redis, and you know do your e-commerce chart. So the multiple packages within um, that one module, and you know ideally, you know whether this is good design that you put API storage and e-commerce in one module. That's a different discussion. And so I would say what modules allow you to do is really dependency management, and we're gonna see it. It's painting like this double role. It's not only saying that these set of packages go together, but it's also saying that oh, there are versions of these packages that uh, sort of go together. It's a way of doing dependency management. And if you come from like Java, you would be using something um, when you do Java application, like Ant back in the days, or Envy before that, or Maven today, or you now, as people have written the last couple of years, been going to, um, Gradle. So Maven and Gradle are still the two most dominant and an NV is like out the window. So, but if regards to, um, you know, Maven is just crazy XML file, the palm that XML is a nightmare. And if you have dependency problems, oh my gosh, good luck. Um, Gradle tried to solve some of the problem in terms of how you represent it and manage it, but still, to me, you have to do a lot of these things. It's not managed automatically for you. The thing I love about Go is that your dependency all pretty much get managed automatically. And we'll see some times when you need to go modify the go.mod file, but we're not going to worry about that individual today, but we'll get to that. Okay, because it's all part about how you manage large applications. So if we go back to our application now, you can see a similarity, right? Like. Applications are made up of packages. Modules are a set of packages. So what's really the difference here? Your application doesn't contain modules in the same sense. Like I said, what I was showing before, the module is more like how you can think of how you might call a subsystem or something like this. But that was very different than the module that you're going to see here. And this module is something that is just something that is managing your source code and you can pull out the packages from the module. So my application 
can say that oh, it's using the API REST package from a certain module or the storage that REST from a certain module. Okay, so you can imagine that multiple companies, let's say, offer or even within your organization, you have multiple modules and one module have API REST, another module have API REST also. And you can see which API REST am I using from which module, okay? And your application that pulls it in and your application is built using those packages, but your application is itself a module, which we will see. This can get a little bit confusing. That's why I say modules are not only being used as a way to group um, packages together, but also as dependency management. And we'll see how modules are versioned and as a result, because your application is using is a module itself, it can say, I'm using this particular version of this package. All right, so we'll see that. So let's jump now back to our command line. Okay, so let's go now and take a look at how modules get to manage multiple packages and also can be used for dependency management. So let's go back up one directory a bit. And so we'll say that oh, this is our project directory, or maybe we'll commit, create a Git repository here. So we're gonna version this entire directory, let's just say. And so what we can do then is we can move things around. So I'll close this directory. I'm going to get rid of all the executables. So I'm gonna say minus type executables. And if I do that, it's gonna see just show me all the executable and I can say minus um, X to remove and so remove those guys. So that's fine. All right, so I have no executable here. Um, if you see and you like what FD is doing, just look for it online. It's a Rust program, you can install binary. Okay, if you have brew, you have a Mac and you have brew, just simply do brew, install FD, that's it. Okay, okay. All right, so I'm back here now with my um, files. So let's put our packages in its own module and our application in a separate. Now, absolutely, we could simply create a module file here. Remember, to create a module, we simply have to do, let's just do create a file. I can do it from anywhere, from the command line, wherever. And I can just create a file here called go.mod, right? And that's a module file. And what's required is just the module keyword. Now, I notice this is not a Go file. This is a that .mod file. That's why I didn't include modules as one of the things that you could put in a Go file, because this is not a Go file. This is a module file. So once I have, I want to create a module anywhere, I put a go.mod file in the root of that directory, and now I give my module a name. Now, we'll talk more about how you name module. Usually, you want to do um, some repo name here, which is going to be a host name and your name. But for now, we'll give it a very simple name and call it my mod or something like that, or whatever, we'll call it module A, for example, right? And that's it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to do anything else. Now, if I run this command here, go mod tidy, so go mod tidy, it's going to put like my current version of go. This is information that when you version this file and you check it out, it actually says which version of Go this module can compile was compiled against. And so if you have a different version, it's not compilable, you would know all that stuff right away. So this is no different than in a palm.xml file, you say which version of Go of Java you're gonna use for compile versus um, you know runtime or whatever. So you know, which version of Java you're supporting for, for that source code. So this is in there and notice it's added automatically. Like I said, this file get pretty much automatically um, maintained for you. So now what I have is a module with several packages. That's what I have, you know, included my main packages. So my module right now has four packages, package A, B, C, and my main package. But maybe what I really wanna do is separate this piece of reusable code. So even though it's a package, it's re reusable because I can create another command directory, you know, or application if you like. So the kind of command I can probably call this application, but you know, app, and then I could still do a subdirectory called command. By the way, right? Um, we talked about all that before, but let's say I call this app one or something, right? Um, I can still have more application directory reusing these packages. But maybe what I really want to do is not sub put everything in this one repo but instead maybe break it up. And so I could have several um, 
a module for just these packages and a module for my application. And let me show you what that would look like. So let's go back to our command line and I'm going to say that I'll, um, oh, no, I can do it anywhere actually. That's an actor. Um, I could do it from within here. I'm going to say I have a new directory and I'm going to call it module one. And again, I could call it module A actually, because that's what I call this module A. And I'll put my packages in there. So package one, um, A, B, and C, sorry. I'll put those within there. And then I'll put this mod file in there. So now I have this module. And this complaint that you're seeing is just something that's an issue with VS Code Editor, where it's saying that if you open up a directory, within the root of that directory, it wants a module file. So it doesn't want to open a directory that has some modules within it, but we'll fix that easily enough. And then here in my go, my application directory, I'll create another file. I'm gonna call it go.mod. And then I'll say module again. And this time I'll just call it app one, for example, as the module here. I could run go tidy if I want. Okay, it's, it's complaining. So let's just quit this VS Code editor. And so what I have now is if I do trick man, what I have is app one is in a module. So I have two modules in this one repository, right? If you I were to commit this directory as a Git repository, I'll have two modules. I have a module here called app one, another module called um, app module A. And within module A, I have three packages within module app one. I only have one package, which is main. But due to the problem with VS Code, I have to open up individual VS Code. So I have to open up a VS Code for app because VS Code want that module file in the root directory. And I'll have to open up a VS Code for module A. Again, because VS Code want the um, module file in the root directory. And now it does not complain. Okay. So extensions have been modified on this reload. Okay, fine, reload. And so that, that's what it is. Now I, I have this all set and done. So here's the thing. How do I use the packages from module A? Because remember, this is module A. How do I use those in my main application? And let's say in package A, there was something I need to use. Right now, there's nothing that I need to use. So, um, but let's say in package A, it's in this file, there was a variable or some constant that's called constant pi is equals to 3.14. So now that we've added um, a constant to package A, let's try and use it in our main application. So we go back to the main application and we're going to say that we want to do, like say FMP print, um, let's do this and we'll say pi equals the percent v new line and then we'll say pkga that and notice we don't get any completion because it doesn't know anything about what's in that package so what i'll do is i'll leave that out for now that's just going to be a warning and then i'll go up here and i'm going to say let's import it's from mod a slash package a actually so remember our package A belong to this module called mod A. So we have to give the full path. And it's gonna say, so, well, I don't know anything about this, could not import this. So think about it for a second. How would it know where to find this module, much less where to get the package from? You know, it's in a totally different directory. Remember, what we're doing is we have this directory for application A. So if I do tree view and I go back up like this, we have Application one is in its own module, right? It has a module file. And then we have the module with the packages and they're in a totally different directory. So we have two module. One represents our application, which groups the packages for our application. And another module, which groups these reusable package that we want to be able to sort of have standalone and we could just pull in and build our application with. So how will module here or application module know how to find the, this module. Well, what we have to do is be able to tell our module in the application 
where it can find this information. And so what we can do is if we go back here, we'll see this is the app module and we can edit. This is just a text file. We can edit it. But what we will do is we will use the command line and we'll say go. Well, we'll have to make sure that we in this directory so you can see I'm in app one, right? I'll say go mod and I'll say edit. And what I want to do, I want to say replace. So if I do edit and I press enter, uh, maybe if I do minus help, I'll see that there's some flags that I can pass, right? Editing flags. Um, as a matter of fact, if I do go mod help edit, we can see that there are a couple of flags and one of them is replace. And so it tells you at all, you can use this command to edit the go module file, the go.mod file. And this is the only file it operates on. What we want to do is replace. Okay. And so what we can do then is say go mod edit and we want to use the replace. And the simple thing we want to replace is we want, since our module is looking for mod A, we want to replace that with something that is in the tell it which path it's in. So you need this when you start developing a package and we're going to in module and we'll talk more about it in the next video and other videos. So I want to replace um, mod A. I want to set it equals to that and go to the mod A directory. Does that make sense? So the thing that I'm using in my application here, go main, I want to replace this module by telling it where exactly to find that module. And that module is located in my a directory one up and then down to mod A, right? We, we saw that already. So if I press enter and now look at my mod file in application, you can see this replace statement that says mod A no points to is really points to you know, this directory, a physical path on my file system. That's what I'm trying to resolve. I'm trying to say, where can I find physically all the files for this module that I'm trying to use? And if I come back here, you'll see if I hover over this now, it'll say it's imported, but um, use that or that. Imported, but not, um, you could not import package, no required module provided. Well, why it says no required module is because when you use a package, Usually in your mod file, it says, oh, this thing is required and therefore included. And so what we can do is we can run, click on go run mod tidy, which is to run the go mod tidy command, or we can do it from the command line. So if you're in your editor, you can do it, but I'll show you from command line, go mod tidy. And the reason I'm doing it from command line is to show you what you see. And so if I do that, you'll see it says found module slash package A in module A. So it's saying now that it found that package, it was able to resolve that package in module A, that's because we had that replace. And it gives them some pseudo version, some made up version now, because we don't have this in a repository. And now if we go back to our Go mod file, notice how it says required module A, and then it gives a version. Now I don't know if you ever looked at a module file, Go mod file, but every time you use something, it would say that it's required and would give a version for it. So here, if I go back now to this, well, it, the reason it's not going away is because it's imported, but it's not used. So let's use it. So I want to say, I want to use PKGA dot, and now you can see Pi shows up before it wasn't being resolved. And now everybody is happy, right? It's imported. First, it was imported, not used, and also couldn't be found, right? It didn't have a require. Then once we resolve it, now everything is happy. And we should be able to right click on this and run, and we should see a printout that says pi equals that, right? So that's all good and dandy. So that shows you how in our application, one module, we could bring in another module. But like I was saying, modules are playing these two roles. The module itself, when you say go that mod, your mod file is saying which version of these different other modules I'm using, in addition to the fact that a module is acting like a container for grouping a set of packages because, and we know this, because here we have a module and it doesn't have any version information right there, but it has a set of packages. And when we go to use any of those packages, we have to say require whichever version of the module. Of course, since it's not committed, we have a fake version 
but the version information is actually in your repo. It's nowhere in your module file. Your module file itself doesn't say anything about which version it is. It's your repository that actually maintain that. And since we don't have this thing checked into our repo, Go is sort of making up a version number. Okay. If you don't know anything about semantic version and uh, any of that stuff, we might talk about it another time. So to sort of drive home this point about the required, um, let's go here and instead of using FMT to print out, we're going to use log Rust, okay, which is a totally external package, but it's going to come in as part of a module, right? Because remember, everybody's sort of moving to Go modules now. And so we will do, um, let's do log, um, log f, right? Info f, sorry, not log f, info f. And so now if I save that, it doesn't know where to find this at all, log rust. So I have to now go online. And so let's go online and I'm going to go to dev that, go to dev. And if I go to go to dev and I do a search for packages and I do log rust, you'll see here it is. And so I'll just grab this. I mean, if I click on this, it will actually tell me exactly how to use it. I can import log rust and call it log, but I'll just use it as log rust. And so I go back here and I'm just going to say, import this guy and now you can see this goes away but here it's telling me that how it's required could we have to go get it because i don't have it on my system and so let's look here and if i go run go tidy see running and notice how it went and it grabbed logros and it put a version number for it because it was able to check the logros repo and said that oh that's the version that I, the latest version that's available because I did not specify a version. So if I want my Go application to restrict and only use a very specific version of Logros because this later version might have a problem or I want to cap it here, Go module acts as a way of grouping packages together and it also happens, acts as dependency management because right here we can see that it's an I need specific version of Logros. And you commit this with your, your code and so going forward, you can always rebuild your application so long as this repository is still available. But at least you know how you can always rebuild it because it wouldn't automatically pull in the latest, it'll pull in this very, very specific version. And if we were to go to the GitHub repository for this and scroll down, you'll see it how they have a Go mod file here. And within it would be all the thing that Logros uses. But notice there's no version information within this Go mod file. It is saying that oh, Go Logros uses these, these modules, but it doesn't say anything about, um, it says what versions those other things are, but it doesn't say anything about the version for Logros itself. The ver version for Logros come from the fact that in the repository, in GitHub repository, this is the latest version and they have probably tagged it somewhere as you know version 1.8.1 and there you can see it and this is the latest tag and that's what was pulled in and used here okay so i'm not going to spend too much time on this but i know you get the idea hopefully and so um this is still working fine so i think i'll end it here it's quite a bit i think the summary and the takeaway here is that your application is composed of all these little pieces and in addition to the packages that your application uses, there's this idea of a module. And a module is a way of grouping packages together that your application would use. Or a module is a way of sharing or distributing packages and reusable code. And in addition to using modules, modules also allow you to maintain or ensure that you can always rebuild your code correctly because it specified a version. So the only thing we can say that I think I can say before closing is that a repository could contain one module, which is what we see for Logros, or a repository can contain multiple modules, which is what we see here in my example. So for example, if I created a Git repository right here and I say Git init, you know, this directory, what I've done is I have actually created a Git repository here within my project, right? And so, 
I could commit this, push this up to some repository, um, you know, like GitHub or something like this. And within this directory, as we know, I have two modules. There is module one and there is module two. So I have two modules for repository. Or if you're looking at this example for Logros, this is the Git repository itself here. This is the Git repository. And the, that Git init file and so on, um, you know, they don't show you that. But this is a Git repository. And at the root of this repository is the Go mod file. And therefore, you have one module per repository. And the way you import that module is simply by using the path. Now, there's actually a really nice um, illustration of this in the Go modules documentation. It's um, HTTP golang.org docs module for slash managing that source. And you can see if you scroll along to some part in there towards the end, it shows you if this is the repository name. So example.com, whatever your host and the module name. But if that's the repo, well, then within it, if you have go at the root, that becomes the module path and you can import it by simply saying this. And then, of course, you can see which package you want to use because you can still have multiple packages. This is package one, but you could imagine you have other package directory, package two, package three. So you could still import the module this way and then whatever package you want to use. And then if you want to use multiple module in one repository, well, then this is still your um, repository directory. But you have the multiple modules like we have. We have app one and module A, each with their mod go that mod file. And then the path for each one of these modules would be, of course, like this. And so then, of course, after this comes the actual package you want to use. Because again, they only show you one package, but remember, you could have multiple packages. So I hope all that makes sense. We're still talking about code organization and structuring your Go application. This one seemed painfully long, but because it's kind of complex and I don't like rushing through things and leaving people still going like, what was that about? So I take my time. I try to explain it. Hopefully you appreciate it. If you do and you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, thumbs up the video, leave some comments and definitely hit the notification bell. So you know when I post video, take care, stay safe and see you in the next video. Bye.